brought to you by Head Start Basketball. First thing is, uh, as trainers um, and, and skills coaches, we have to remember these aren't our players. Um, and so in, in my world, although it's less common in the NBA for a head coach to have an opinion, the head coach has a strong opinion on what he wants that player doing in certain situations. It's my job to then take that player and build their skills to be able to execute his system. Now that doesn't happen as much in the NBA. That's more of a college basketball thing. Uh, but I always try and keep that in mind. Coach Dave Love is an NBA shooting coach from Calgary, Canada. Dave started playing basketball at age 12 and became, in his own words, a very average high school player that was a good shooter but had a great mentor. He got into coaching around age 25, focusing on being a shooting coach, which most people weren't doing at that time. Dave started the Love of the Game shooting clinics in his hometown and worked for the local university team for nine years as a shooting coach. Coach Love started working in the NBA in 2009-2010 with the Phoenix Suns. In 2013-2014, he was hired by the Cavs to help Tristan Thompson switch from being a left-handed shooter to being a right-handed shooter, and Tristan shot a career high that year. The next season, Dave was hired by the Orlando Magic to help Aaron Gordon. Aaron improved 30% from the free throw line in his rookie season compared to his previous year in college. Over the next three seasons, Coach Love worked with Alfred Payton, Dwayne Dedman, and Bismack Biombo all of whom shot career highs in their time with Dave. Dwayne went from deep on the bench and 55% from the free throw line to starting, shooting threes, and making 80 plus percent from the line. While working with NBA teams and players has given Dave wonderful experiences and has allowed him to work with some of the best players in the world, his true calling and passion lies in working with young basketball players and helping them improve their shooting skills. Coach Love now works independently with players and agents, as well as running youth shooting clinics around the world. After listening to this episode, please take a moment to leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to the show. Those ratings really do help other members of the basketball community find the Hoopheads podcast. If you'd like to support the show, please visit our Patreon link, which you can access via the homepage at www.hoopheadspod.com. Have your pen and paper ready as we take a deep dive into the art of teaching shooting with NBA shooting coach Dave Love from Calgary, Canada. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are here with shooting coach extraordinaire, Coach Dave Love. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate it, guys. Looking forward to uh, to chatting with you. All right. So we want to start off right away, Dave, with going back to your time as a young kid and how you got into the game of basketball and why shooting became your forte both as a player and as a coach. Well, I, I got into it. I'm, I'm Canadian. And so like any good Canadian, I started off playing hockey. And when I was about uh, 10 or 11 years old, uh, the governing body for the little hockey league that we had said, all right, everybody, uh, next year, body checking is allowed. And I said, no, thank you. I'm out of here. <laughs> and uh, my dad was a, uh, a junior college player up here in Canada. But I guess that would have been back in like the early 60s and, uh, and was a high school coach. And so I was kind of a little bit around the game, but not at any serious level. And uh, my first big basketball memory would be watching Larry Bird and Dominique Wilkins. I think it was in 87 in, I think, an Eastern Conference game. You probably know the game that I'm talking about. That, du- that was a duel between those two guys. Yeah. Coach Jason was a little too young for that. I was only one, so Coach Jason I don't doesn't remember, remember Coach Jason does not remember that game, but I, but I remember that one quite well. Them going back and forth, yeah. bucket for bucket in the fourth quarter. That, that's exactly right. And so I, I discovered that if I, if I squeeze my hands together really, really tight, it was like creating a, dr- a direct connection to Larry Bird, and uh, I could will him to do something. But I was smart enough to realize I couldn't use that every single time. <laughs> and so I, I only used it on uh, certain occasions when we needed a steal or a big bucket. And so I was a huge part of that uh, that Boston Celtic win. And uh, and Larry Bird became a uh, a hero of mine, and I related to his – uh, his ability to shoot the basketball. I thought of myself as a, as a shooter, even though I was very, very new to the game. Uh, but I had pretty good hand-eye coordination, and, uh, and that's the part of the game that I loved the most. And so that's kind of where it started for me. 
so Canadian basketball has obviously taken off in the last five to 10 years. But if you go back to that time when you were a kid, what were the opportunities like for you to actually play while you were there in Canada? There was nobody. We had a community league um, that very few kids would play in. Uh, the city at that time that I live in, Calgary, Alberta, would have been probably about 800,000 people. So it's not an insignificant size city. Uh, and there may have been uh, a thousand or two kids playing basketball of all ages. And uh, so it was very small. And uh, and then just all these, the, the coaching wouldn't have necessarily been great. The facilities were, were behind. It was this not even secondary sport. It was three levels below secondary. Um, and uh and in every in every way and uh we would get the occasional i don't know what was like down there in the states at that time but in the uh sort of mid to late 80s you would get one nba game a week uh only after the super bowl so after football ended and so very little exposure to to any of this stuff but uh now we're to the point where Toronto is a it's an Americanized city for basketball and uh, an elite Americanized city. And it's kind of drifting across the country. It's taking time um, because it is a large country that's very spread out population wise. But uh, the uh, improvement in the, the quality of players and, and coaches as well is, is growing significantly, especially in the last 10 years. So two questions for you, one specifically about you and then two about Canadian basketball. So the first one about you, with all that being said, in terms of the limitations of the size of the league, the number of kids playing, the coaching, all that stuff, what was it about the game of basketball that after you left hockey, you're like, this is what it's all about for me. Like, I love the game of basketball. Was it the exposure that you had to being a Larry Bird fan in that one NBA game a week? Or what was it about the game that really took a hold of you and grabbed on? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, it, a number of things all put together, uh, because as much as I joke about, okay, I, the reason I got out of hockey was body checking, because I identified with Larry, or Mr. Bird, I should probably be calling him, <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, for like, just knowing that he was the kind of guy to dive on the floor. I loved that sort of physical contact. And so uh, it was almost a 180 degree turn for me on, on the reason I left hockey. Uh, but then I, I I was good at anything sort of been involving a little hand-eye coordination and muscle memory. So I took to shooting pretty quickly um, and and sort of formed a little bit of an identity uh, in myself around that. And I think that the next biggest part was just I love the creativity of it, that you could do something on the basketball floor, throw a type of pass that – uh, that nobody had ever thrown before, and it felt very organic, and uh, and as opposed to something like a volleyball, where it's it's very predetermined what you're going to try to do. This was just it was jazz, and uh, and that was just so exciting to to do that, and then be able to have my little niche inside that chaotic game of this skill that that I thought I was pretty good at. So where did you get an opportunity to work? on your game when you were a kid? Because obviously there's a large portion of the year where you're not be able to be outside on your driveway or playing at a playground. So where did you get an opportunity to go in and work on your shooting, work on your basketball when you were a kid? It's, uh, it's probably, you guys are in the Cleveland area from what I understand. And so it's yes. probably not a lot different for, uh, uh, for me than it was for you. I would shovel the driveway and, uh, and go out and, I would steal. My mom had these thin knit gloves that only cost about a dollar a pair, and uh, and she couldn't figure out why they were going missing all the time. So <laughs> I was stealing them so that I had this thin glove to be able to shoot out uh, outside, even in the uh, the winter. And it's um, probably not as cold a winter necess- at all times as as Americans tend to think it is, uh, although we do get some cold. Um, so it was the, the driveway and the, the park and, uh, practicing alone and, uh, you practice your dribbling by running to the park and, uh, and then you played a game in your head against imaginary oppositions and, 
and shot and and just all that creative creativity and imaginative play that that uh, I think we all kind of grew up with and hopefully kids still have. Yeah, basketball lends itself to that so well. The really ability does. to just go out and be able to play one on one and imagine games and my guy when I was young, uh, I was born in 1970, so my guy when I was very very young was Dr. J. And okay. so that's the first that's the first player that I remember sort of trying to uh, I guess emulate. I was not very well well able to emulate Dr. J with my lack of leaping ability, but certainly that was the first guy that I remember seeing on TV and and being able to think, wow, I could you know play against that guy one on one out on my driveway and imagine hitting the game winning sh- shot or being his teammate. And basketball just does such a great job of allowing you to practice and get better on your own, which I think makes it unique compared to a lot of other sports where it's really difficult to practice baseball or football when you don't have teammates, whereas basketball, you don't need anybody else and you don't need a lot of space and you can go out and disappear for hours, whether it's on your driveway when it's snowing and you got to shovel the snow or whether it's on a perfect summer afternoon. Uh, I think basketball is, is so unique in that way, and it sounds like you had a similar experience to the one I did, which is just spending a lot of time out on the court by yourself working on your game. Yeah, and, and I, I can always – I can remember even at a fairly young age, probably about 16 years old, knowing that I was a better shooter than most of the people I knew because I practiced more than most of the people I knew, That uh, that for me – it was I would watch the first quarter of a game uh, if there was one to watch and then escape to the park like I got bored watching and I want to go do myself. And uh, and that was it was just so fun to to go out and baseball season. You go and do the same thing. And then uh, then Wimbledon would come on TV and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out a way to to play something resembling tennis by yourself. And uh, and it was but basketball is, is just so easy. All right. So Bird was your basketball guy. Who was your tennis guy? I didn't really have a tennis guy until later. I think Andre Agassi was. I really liked the uh, the transition that he went from like all uh, all sizzle no steak to all steak and no sizzle. And uh, and for whatever I have these weird things that that I gravitate towards. Like you talked about uh, Dr. J. Uh, in my I'm just a little younger than you, so it became a Michael Jordan for us. And all the the kids want to be Michael, and I thought, well, I can't do the things that he does, so I can't relate <laughs> to that. You but can't I jump can... from the free throw line and dunk. No, I, I could jump from the free throw line and land at the dots. Does that there you count? Go. That's that count. That counts. We'll give we'll give you credit for that, Dave. I like it. I, I gravitate to people that I could relate to, and uh, um, and so that was like guys, and now it's. Uh, Tiger Woods is probably one of my uh, favorite athletes right now. And I, what I love about him is just his willingness to continue to, uh, to change his swing in an effort to grow. And I, 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 I'm secretly optimistic that he's going to be back to where he was or a version of where he was. And it'll be four times now that we've written off Tiger Woods and that he's come back to be the number one golfer in the world. And I think that's amazing. Yeah. At his height. I, I don't think there was anybody mentally tougher when he was at the height of his powers than Listen, Tiger. Tiger is my I, – I sit at home and watch golf. This whole past weekend, I, I mean, I have the PGA Tour alive. I don't know if you have the if they have that thing up in Canada or not, but we can sit and pay $5 a month, which is, you know, just an extra way to get money. But I can sit and watch him in feature group pairings all day, and I don't have to watch anyone else. And that's all I care about is watching him play golf. Yeah, the the uh, the tour or the uh, match play championship this weekend uh, for me stopped at about uh, 4:30 p.m. on Saturday. It, yeah, I, when, was he lost, when he after. lost, missed that, missed that putt. It was over. I, you know, well, I don't even know. Do you know who won? Because I don't. Don't, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what I mean, just from a perspective of how much he's meant to the game of golf from uh, just what we're all describing. In that, you know, you're. Yeah, you like watching golf, but specifically you like watching Tiger. And the thing that, like I said, always attracted me to him as a player was just the fact that it, it felt like he was always going to come through. He was always going to make that big putt. He was always going to come through in the moment. I think that's one of the things that when I look at my favorite athletes over time, and you know, I'm a big Michael Jordan's the greatest of all time because of 
just that mental toughness and that willingness to do whatever it was going to take in order to, you know, be successful and win the game. And I think I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later as you talk more about what you do as a shooting coach, but the mental side of sports and the mental side of shooting is such a, an important part of, I think, especially when you get to the highest levels, the guys who are able to continue to perform at their peak under stress, under pressure are the guys that really end up succeeding at a very, very high level. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing that I end up, uh, uh, you, you said something that made me think I, I cheer for greatness. There are people, a lot of people out there that cheer for the underdog. Um, and I, I get that. And at times maybe, but I want to see great players do great things. And I want to be able to say, yeah, I saw Tiger Woods win 14 major championships and go through a time where like he was unbeatable. And I saw Tom Brady and I saw these guys like I want to I cheer for the great. Uh, Yeah, I agree. It's fun to watch the best of the best at their peak level, because I think anybody who's played sports at any level or coached sports at any level realizes how difficult it is to achieve some of the things that the guys that we've just mentioned have been able to achieve, whether that's from a physical standpoint or, again, I think a huge piece of it is just how mentally tough those guys are. You think about Tom Brady, who's 40 years old, and he's been going to NFL training camps for 18 years or 19 years. At some point, for the average person, for the average player, that becomes a grind that they just don't want to put up with anymore. And the fact that he's still doing it at that age and still is having the amount of success that he's had and wins another Super Bowl. To me, just the mental toughness, forget about the physical durability to be able to do that, but the mental toughness to be able to continue to go and do that at the age of 40 years old is, is incredible. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a glimpse into what life in the NBA uh, can look like along those lines. Uh, typically uh, a day after a back to back coaches will give players a day off. And, uh, and there might be, there might be a day off every two weeks, um, that other than that, you're, you're traveling, you are playing or you're practicing. And so days off are very, very, very rare. And I learned pretty quickly that there really aren't days off that even when you give team or players a day off, they're still coming into the gym and, in my first year in the NBA, I was shocked when we had a day off, and I went in uh, just to, to grab something early on and, and realized, oh, we have eight players that came in or coming. <laughs> in. Uh, so, like, and that, so that we ended up with a second level where it was this is a lockout day. Like, we are locking the doors to the physical. You are not, and that might happen once or twice in a, uh, a season where you have a, a lockout day and say, you're not, don't even think about coming in. Uh, well, you're not out. So yeah. That's, I think that's interesting. The guys at that high level, there's a reason why they get to the level that they do. And sometimes people on the outside who don't see all that hard work and preparation that goes into being successful as an NBA player or whatever sport you want to talk about, you forget that the amount of work that those guys put in and yeah, maybe they have outstanding physical characteristics and they're taller and bigger and faster and stronger but there's a lot of tall, fast, big, strong guys out there that don't end up making it at the highest level. And I think that dedication and the time that players put in really ultimately does make the difference in who makes the league, who sticks in the league, and who becomes you know, the, an all-star player versus just an average player. Yeah, I have a guy that, uh, that I work with that uh, in the summers he'll be in L.A., and I'll go down to work with him, and we will typically – meet at either seven or eight in the morning for our shooting workout. And most of the time he's coming from having run on the beach. So if it's a 7 a.m. workout, he's already been like he was probably up at five and uh, and at the beach at, at, at six to do his his cardio. And and then he's coming to shoot with me and then he's going to go do this and then he's going to go do that. And then he's going to shoot with me later in the afternoon and then he's done. And people don't don't know that. Yeah, they don't see that, right? They don't they don't see all that work that goes on behind the scenes. There's no question about that. When you were growing up and you were playing, did you always know you wanted to be a coach or was that something that grew on you as you continued on in the game or was coaching something that always was in your blood from a young age? Uh, I think it might have been in my blood per se. 
but it's not something I ever thought of. I think when you're that young, uh, most players are uh, have a disdain for coaches, and coaches are only slightly above referees. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so it, it didn't really cross my mind. Uh, but I, I met uh, a fellow who was my became my mentor who uh, really, without me knowing it, he started my shooting coach career uh, when I was about 14 years old and started teaching me about how he shot the basketball and in way more detail than I'd ever seen. And now he's a shooting coach in the NBA, uh, still a mentor of mine, still somebody that I, I, I hang off of every word that he says and uh, – uh, have the utmore, ut, utmost respect for. And so he's really the one that kind of started me on that path without me even realizing it at that age. So talk about what your first coaching opportunity was and what some of your initial challenges were as a coach. What what did you find to be difficult the first time you stepped onto a floor as a coach? Well, I had no uh, desire to be a head coach or assistant coach. I wanted to be, I really only had interest in being a shooting coach. And this is back when, especially at a youth level, that wasn't being done, at least in my area. And I don't think it was being done much, really anywhere. A little bit here and there, but uh, but I don't think in the... Uh, late 90s, early 2000s, that there were nearly as many trainers or or shooting coaches now as, as there are now. So it was, uh, I, I did a year as a, a head coach for um, a U11 team. Um, and thought, oh, this is like a fun way to spend a, a couple hours a week. But uh, there was no master plan. And I always had in the back of my mind, because, because of my mentor, that one day I would start my own shooting camps. And uh, at, in my early 20s, I kept saying that and then think, I think because being young and stupid and naive, I, I think <laughs> I was actually waiting for somebody else to start my shooting camps for me and then hand them off to me, which of course is never going to happen. And, uh, and so it was finally in my mid twenties that I started to realize, oh shoot, if I'm going to do this, I actually have to put in the effort. And so I, I really, I called myself a shooting co- uh, coach. Um, uh, I scheduled some gym time, uh, made up a terrible word file brochure and just started emailing anybody that I could find with an email address, uh, in, in Calgary that might be able to get, help me get the word out for this shooting clinic and, and the, so I ran the first one and thought it was fantastic. And I look back now and think, man, that was terrible. Uh, <laughs> but it was the start. And we all start at terrible at, at something and then slowly get better at it. And so I spent, I've gone through a bunch of different uh, levels of being a shooting coach where, um, so when somebody asked me, you know, when did you start? I kind of have to say, well, do you mean like, clinics for kids or do you mean like working with players or do you mean like working with NBA people? Cause they're all kind of a different phase of the, uh, uh, the career that I've gone through. And so let's uh, talk about that first camp, the, the first camp that you put, that you put on. Sure. What do you remember about that in terms of sort of the structure and, and what you were teaching or what your <laughs> methods were like, um, you know, compared right. to maybe what you're doing now? the people who might be thinking about starting their, their own camp first advice uh, don't schedule it for the day after the uh, daylight savings time uh, <laughs> change uh, because we had a two-hour camp and half of my coaches uh, that I, I had coming in who were like my sister and her friend and a buddy of mine, uh, half of them showed up an hour late because they forgot about the time change. We didn't have phones back then that automatically changed. You had to actually set an alarm clock. And, uh, and so that don't make that mistake. And then I can, I had a two hour clinic and there was probably 45 minutes of just filler that I don't know how to really fill two hours of content or two hours with content. So we're going to do three man weave and I'm going to make up a reason why this is shooting appropriate. Um, so lots of stuff like that. Uh, and now I run day long or two day clinics and I don't have enough time for all the content that I would want to get into it. Uh, but 
that's where you start is you, you start with an idea and you learn how to, to fill and you learn from all the mistakes that you made. So uh, it was like three man weave and there was a lot of form shooting. And then I realized, oh, wait, we just can't stand here and do form shooting the entire time. We'll actually have to like we have to actually have levels and progressions in form shooting. And that was sort of uh, the biggest thing that got me thinking early on. Yeah, you might not get anybody back if you spent, spent two hours doing form shooting. No, my poor NBA players, they they go through weeks and constant form shooting and different variations of it and progressions through it. So uh, those guys probably want to put a bullet in my head. <laughs> I, can, I can so, imagine. How many kids did you get for the first camp? Uh, I sold out the first one with 36 kids. I, I right. said I'm going to take uh, – uh what would that be was six kids per hoop we had six hoops in the gym and then my second clinic i got five kids and i barely paid for the gym but i just thought okay this is this is what it looks like like you might start off with a bang and then you got to build a reputation and i just i didn't give up just like any shooter like you're you're making a change you might get a little worse and uh but you got to know that it's the right thing to do and you got to pay your dues and you got to make your mistakes and learn from them and get better and so the five kids in the second clinic became nine in the third became 12 uh became got came back to a sellout probably a year down the road um and then running two clinics and then outside of this like traveling to the little towns outside of the uh the city and uh and it just it kind of grew. Were you working at another job at that point when you first started? Like, what were you, what were you doing as far as career wise? Because obviously, if you're running a camp and you have nine kids, you're not making a living off that. So, right. what were, what were you doing otherwise for your job as you were kind of building up this the shooting uh, clinic business? I, I took, uh, and it was never my goal for it to be my full time income. The shooting camps that uh, that I thought this will be a nice little supplementary thing that I do that's really fun and it makes me a couple hundred dollars a month. That was honestly when I started, that was my biggest goal, two or three hundred dollars more a month from these camps. And uh, so I was working at a TV station. Um, I had taken broadcasting as at a, uh, a, a local college uh, here in Calgary and I, I looked at broadcasting and thought that doesn't sound like work. <laughs> and uh, I got a job at a TV station uh, right after college and, and worked there. as And so I did that for a number of years. I think it was eight years. And then the shooting camps were getting to the point where I was starting to do them outside of the city and around different cities within our province, uh, Canadian equivalent to a state. And, uh, and then I started to say, okay, with the shift work that I'm working at the TV station, I don't have evenings and I, I miss out on like every third or fourth weekend or whatever my schedule is like. And I, I made the jump to Canada Post to uh, deliver the mail uh, because I could work then from 7 a.m. until about 1, 1 p.m. And, uh, and then hustle to the university that I was vol volunteering as a shooting coach by that time uh, for afternoons to work with players uh, on a volunteer basis. Um, and I did that job for another eight years and I actually took a leave of absence from Canada post, uh, to go work for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And, uh, and so even when I was the a shooting consultant for the Phoenix Suns, my income was coming from Canada post that I would take days off and, and, and call in sick for the days that I was going down to Phoenix to work with NBA players. And uh, I used to be embarrassed about those kind of like admitting that, that here I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a shooting coach, but really I'm a, uh, uh, a mailman. And, uh, and now it's kind of a badge of honor where I, I, I'm proud of the fact that I paid my dues and I did what I needed to do to, um, to support myself and my family and give myself an opportunity where I could volunteer uh, to get an opportunity that I might not have otherwise gotten if I expected to get paid. And uh, and that ended up being a huge benefit to me. And then I've heard from a lot of people, and I'm sure you guys have heard even more, that I've learned that it's a, it's a common story, that uh, my buddy Jay Hernandez, who's a, 
an assistant coach with the Charlotte Hornets. He talks about three times in his in his life he's made huge financial sacrifices uh, to grow his his basketball career. That uh, um, he took massive pay cuts from whatever his stable job was to gamble on himself, and uh, that's what you have to do. Yeah, I think that there's a misperception out there in the public about. I don't know if how easy it is or just how glamorous the coaching business is or can be. And people see, you know, now we're in the midst of March Madness. So you see these Division One head coaches that are making millions of dollars. And you see, obviously, the salaries that coaches make in the NBA. And what you don't see is all the time that those guys spent, you know, whether it's just being the film guy or whether it's volunteering to – you know, be be a video coordinator or just being an assistant to an assistant to an assistant and making, in some cases, no money where you're a volunteer just right. to be able to get your foot in the door and have an opportunity or you're being paid very, very, very little. And people don't always think about the amount of dues that it takes, and the amount of hard work and sacrifice that it takes to be able to get that, quote, glamour job where you are working with players at the highest level or you are working with players that are more visible maybe than a high school coach or a you know a lower level college coach people don't see the amount of time that gets put into to doing that it's I, i'm glad you shared that story because i think there's again a perception out there that you know that doing basketball full time whether it's as a shooting coach or a a trainer or running camps or whatever, that it's that it's easy to make that happen and you should be able to make tons and tons of money doing that. And I think the reality is it's 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 difficult and it takes a lot of hard work. And the reason why the people who are successful are successful is because they put that time in to develop their craft and make sure that they're providing value to the players, kids, teams, coaches that they're that they're working for. Right. Yeah. The, the, one of my best buddies in Orlando was uh, um, with the I don't want to give away who it is or uh, uh, but he was within the front office and it like a, uh, started off in a, my first year was his first year. And he was low, basically an entry level front office intern position. And then he in his third year, he was then hiring the interns. Uh, for that same front office position that he once had and we went for dinner one night and we were just kind of talking about like the, the the questions that we get from people on social media about like how do I get a job in the NBA and he said what what people don't understand is the people that I'm turning down for these internships are Yale graduates or Harvard graduates like these are the people that aren't getting it we have one and every every team might have one so there's 30 possibilities in the world of this. If you don't have something special that you're bringing to the table, if your special thing is, I'm a nice guy I'm an, and I'm a hard worker, awesome. So are 10 <laughs> other people. And so you got to, the advice that I always give is you got to figure out what you love uh, that makes you special, then get really good at it and, and be able to demonstrate value then do it for free to show that you're indispensable to the point where somebody says, well, I, I can't lose you because you're indispensable, so I'm going to pay you. And that's really the only path there is for you to say, I'm a nice guy and I'm a hard worker. Well, that, that doesn't even get your foot in the door. Yeah, that's great advice. So to that point, from the very beginning of your first camp to get to the point where you had those opportunities that you've been able to earn what did you do to perfect your craft how did you go about improving your methodology your technique as a coach what describe the process of your self-improvement from the time you first started as a quote shooting coach into kind of where you are now uh the first thing that i i think there were three parts of it number one i worked with players uh, as opposed to just having a theory, which a lot of people do. They're just armchair shooting coaches. I worked with players and and realized very quickly, okay, I know a theory, uh, but I have no idea how to help a player apply that theory. Like I have form shooting and that's it. 
and I can't, I just realize I can't go from form shooting and say, okay, now go do this at game speed. I needed to somehow help a player bridge the gap so they could learn to apply whatever change we were making um, in the form shooting situation, learn to apply that in the, the game situation. And, uh, and pr- with the, every player, you just start to add new drills um, to help you bridge these gaps that you end up finding where, okay, they can do this new thing now in this situation, but they can't do it in that situation. What's a drill that I can invent or create to help them bridge that gap? I think the, uh, the second thing that, uh, that I did really well, now I'm starting to remember them, uh, is I held myself accountable to tangible improvement. And this was sort of advice that I got from my mentor that, uh, that he said, if, if you want to be good at this, you have to prove that you make players better, that it can't just be, yeah, I believe, I feel like Bobby improved. He's more confident and, and given fluff BS answers. You have to be able to say, here's the numbers before, here's the numbers are after. That's This is how you know I'm good at this job, that I make players better. And here's So how the- did you do that? So here's my, So my question for you is, if you're just a single shooting coach and you're in a gym with a player – how are you keeping track of, how are you making the numbers? How are you getting that tangible evidence that Bobby's a better shooter? Um, by starting, it, it, for me, it started out as simple as, uh, you know, uh, shoot 100 free throws. How many do you make? Okay, in two months, we better be able to make more. Uh, what did it, approximately what did, because nobody would have stats in, uh, 1997 in Canadian high school basketball. Uh, uh, what, what approximately would you have shot from the free throw line last year? Like, what would you, uh, what would you have shot from the three point line? And then just doing our best to to uh, determine are we improving? Like, I wanted to. I knew okay at the NBA level they have statistics. This is fantastic. I have to pretend it at the very least that I'm holding myself accountable to that, those statistics. And then in the NBA, you actually do, and everything's kind of charted uh, so that you know for sure. This player used to shoot in his uh, college year, he shot 42% from the free throw line. In his rookie year, he shot 72% from the free throw line. He got better. So sometimes you have to get creative and you have to, uh, but I, I like as simple as just shooting 100 free throws. And just like I track my weight, I'm trying to lose 10 pounds. And uh, I'll, if, just like I'm tracking my weight daily, I'll track the free throws daily. And I better see that 68 becomes 72 and 71 and 73 and then 75 and then 64. Okay, that was a bad day. And now we're up into like, well, we had a 76. We had a 73. Oh, 73 felt like a bad day there and, and just – just being aware and holding yourself accountable. I, d- I don't know that it needs to be anything super formal. Gotcha. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've always found to be a challenge as, uh, you know, when I'm working with an individual player and you're trying to go ahead and demonstrate to them that, hey, you know, you're getting better. And so I, I, I went back and forth and there were times where I would try to track, you know, different shooting drills and keep track of this one and day to day or, you know, week to week when I'm working with a player. And I always found for me that that was somewhat distracting from my actual coaching. So I'm too busy worried about whether the shot goes in or not and barking it down or, you know, recording it. And obviously now there's some technology that's out there that can keep track of some of that stuff for you, depending on what type of technology you bring into the gym with you. But ultimately for me, what I always found, and I don't know if you found this to be the case, but I always wanted to put my focus on the player that I was working with and the actual technique that they were using when they were shooting the ball or working on whatever skill it was that we were working on. And I found that having a pen and paper or having some type of electronic device to keep track of it distracted me from really focusing on the technique of the player, which ultimately to me is the most important thing. Well, and, and that's what's going on in your head, which I totally agree with. And then imagine what's going on in the player's head, where as soon as they see the, the pen and paper come out or the phone come out, you, they're no longer focused on their improvement and their mechanics. They're now focused on the result because they know you're focused on the result. And so I always, 
hated the uh, one NBA team that I worked for. Uh, they wanted everything charted. We want every shot charted. And I had a, a player that was uh, that was uh, going through a very significant rebuild. And I knew that the results in the beginning in the first couple of weeks were going to be disastrous. And I didn't want him to have to worry about how that would be perceived. And so I just said, like, we're not charting his his stuff for a long time until we can be proud of the stuff that we're charting because he needs to focus on making the right motion first before we can start worry about worrying about what the, the result is. Do you find, and again, just speaking in generalities here, that when you start working with a player and obviously if you're going to change some of their mechanics, their results are probably going to go backwards first before they go forwards because you're teaching them a new set of movements and a new way of doing things. And so yeah. do, you do you find you have to mentally prepare a player for that type of situation? Obviously, depending on the age of, so age of the player. 100% you have to mentally prepare them. And that's that is – that's 25% of my job throughout the entire process, not just in the beginning, but I now have enough experience where I know the pitfalls that they're probably going to go through. And we might be lucky and we might kind of skip one or two of them. And I don't know exactly when they're going to occur, but we know for sure that not every day is going to be better than the last. And so early on in the process, I'll be talking to players to say, Hey, this is fantastic. Like you've had three really good shooting days in a row. This is great, but I won't sugarcoat it. I'll, I'll make sure and say to them, but just remember, like you're not a robot. This is not an escalator that, uh, that we're going to have a day where you're going to struggle and that's perfectly fine. We're not going to panic and really kind of preparing them for what they're uh, they're going to face. And I think that's a, a huge part of what we as coaches have to do, especially skill development coaches. I don't necessarily think that it's, it's preordained that a player is going to get worse before they get better because there are some players that they have, they really struggled because of a physical flaw in their shot. And as, and they're maybe they may be completely unaware of it and not even realize they're doing it. And once you change it, Sometimes, not always, uh, but sometimes the results are immediate. And sometimes you can make a change to, uh, I think the easiest example is, is uh, players' balance or their, their feet, which is far away from what people perceive. Most people, when you think about a shot, you think about the motion of the arms. You don't think about the feet. But you can make a change to the feet that doesn't negatively impact a, a player. It can only potentially positively impact. So uh, it could go either way. A lot of times there is some regression, but many times there there isn't at the same time. How much time do you spend when you get a new client? I'm talking more about what you're doing today as opposed to back when you were just doing shooting camps with, uh, with the kids. But if you're going to work with one player, let's say it's an NBA player, how much time do you spend looking at their shot, whether it's on film or in person, and really going through and figuring out what their mechanical flaws are or what they're doing before you actually get them on the court and start trying to change their mechanics? Well, the, the second that somebody sort of comes on my radar as a possibility, I'll spend time then uh, and, and look at uh, as much as I possibly can, like Synergy Now and all these other websites are, like it makes it really easy to get good tape on guys. But even good tape is way less helpful than the first three minutes in the gym with them. So I try and have I try and watch as much as I possibly can on a guy, um, which I mean, if, if somebody's had a, a, a three year career, I probably am not going to watch every single shot of their career. I'm probably going to watch a hundred plus free throws um, and a lot of open threes just to see you. What are their habits when they have time to do what they want uh, until I until I really get a sense of what those look like? But I learn more in the first five shots that I see them take in person than all of those shots that I watch on video. Video is is tough and it, it can trick you and it can lie. Um, 
to you on, on what you think you're seeing. So I try and have an opinion and then those first 30 seconds, I'm really trying to confirm or change my opinion on why, why the player struggles. When you work with an NBA player or a professional player, do you, does it tend to be that they reach out to you or do you reach out to them as a possibly working with them? What, what, how does uh, that typically go down? It could go any way, but I'll speak to how it's worked for me. I've had teams uh, and agents reach out to me uh, as opposed to players reaching out to me or me reaching out to anyone. That, uh, that all the, the opportunities that I've gotten um, uh, in the beginning, they, they mostly came through my mentor that, uh, that people go to him asking, Hey, we'd like to have somebody like you, but there's only one of you who can you recommend? And, and my name was fortunately on that list. Um, now I have a bit of my own reputation and, uh, and so with teams and, uh, teams and agents will reach out to me sort of on behalf of the player. And uh, I, I don't approach anybody. If, if I'm the one that's approaching somebody to work, then it's not going to work. That they need to know that they have a problem and, uh, uh, and they, they need to want my help. So in that 30, first 30 seconds on the court, what do, you, what do you look for? What are the areas? What are the places? What are the mechanics that you're looking for in that first 30 seconds with the player to get an idea of where you need to start? helping them to improve their shot? Good question. I start with the flight of the ball. And this this took me, I only really got good at this probably in the last four years. I, I started doing my camps in 2001. I started working with NBA players in 2009. I only got good at this in like 2013 where I, like looking at the ball, seeing how the ball reacts out of their hand and then saying, okay, well, if that's what I'm seeing, a flat shot or a tornado spin or they miss left. Uh, if that's what I'm seeing, then I sort of have a pretty good idea what the flaw might be that would cause the ball to react that way. And then you go looking for uh, to, to see, okay, which, which one of these potential things might it be? Uh, and so you're looking then at, at their body to see what is causing the, the ball to react the way that it is. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't think that most people would probably think that you would look at the ball, which obviously isn't directly connected to the person. Um, right. You know, I, I would guess that most people would probably say, well, you're going to look at their hand placement or you're going to look at their the balance of their feet or you're going to look at where their offhand is. And yeah. Are and those, so those people, those people, and this is, I was one of these people and probably to a certain extent still in, but I'm, I'm getting much better at it. Uh, those people are then trying to fit the player into the theory. And don't get me wrong. I have very strong opinions on my theory of shooting a basketball, but I also have a, a pretty clear understanding of what is actually important and what is just sort of my personal preference. And so now I can, I can identify better um, that the flaw that individual and help that individual rather than just say, oh, well, he does, according to my theory, he doesn't do this well. Um, it's, it's more physics based on if he misses left a lot, his hand would have to be here. That's what's got and identifying the true cause of their flaw rather than trying to fit them into a new box. Registration is now open at www.headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps this summer at Strongsville, Westlake, Avon Lake, Oberlin, Brunswick, Highland Heights, Mentor, and Hudson. At Head Start Basketball, we care deeply about making a positive impact on the lives of young basketball players, both on and off the court. It's through building strong relationships with our players, parents, and coaching staff that we are able to use the game of basketball to enrich the lives of those we interact with, both inside and outside of our organization. We believe that our attention to detail, our growth mindset, and our commitment to lifelong learning allows us to help our players achieve their fullest potential. We are passionately committed to providing players, parents, and coaches with everything they need to reach their goals. These core values run through everything we do. Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, 
and discover why you should attend a Head Start basketball camp this summer. Hope to see you there. You mentioned your theory of shooting. So talk a little bit about what your theory of shooting looks like when you step out onto the floor and you're thinking about being able to help a player in the best way possible. Perfect. Um, and one, one of the things I say in the uh, coaches clinic that I, I do, um, have your theory, know it like the back of your hand and then forget it and fix the player that you're working with. So I don't want to get too hung up on what theory should be because I don't think there is a definitive answer. But uh, generally what I, I what I start with is I want to see as much of their body as possible creating energy at the hoop or straight up in the air. And so I call those two kinds of energy positive power, that if you're creating energy at the hoop or straight up in the air, that energy helps you make shots. Um, and if you're creating energy that goes just a little bit offline in any direction, then that energy is negative because it's not actually going at the rim. It's going slightly outside the rim. So it's going to cause a miss. Um, and so, of course, we're not robots. We're not going to be able to do that perfectly. But like how much can we what part of our body and how much are we creating positive power as opposed to negative power? And then I'll compare with uh, that negative power that I'm seeing. Like they rotate their feet when they shoot. They start out reasonably square to the rim, but they finish pointed at 10 o'clock uh, on the clock. OK, that should cause left misses. Are we getting left misses? Uh, if so, great. Now we know uh, or have an idea what to fix. If not, then what might they be doing that would cause the ball to go right independently, but is canceling out the left of their feet to create straight? So you're just you're constantly trying to figure out cause and effect and uh, and just determine what parts of your body are creating energy in what directions kind of a convoluted answer. No, I think that's I think that's right on in terms of when you look at somebody's shot and this is one of the things that I guess I would say when I'm working with somebody is I try to look for something that's going offline. So whether that's the follow throughs offline, the feet are offline, the you know the guide hand is offline and when you're when you do that then you have to figure out ways to compensate for that and I think of myself as a shooter and again, I came up in an era where there wasn't shooting coaches, when there wasn't somebody really analyzing my shot. And I was a pretty good shooter back in my time. But I look at the way I shoot the ball, and I I thumb the ball with my you know with my guide hand, which is my left hand. And to me, I look at that now, and I wonder that if somebody had fixed that for me when I was 10, with the amount of time that I spent shooting the ball. Uh, you know, obviously I had to compensate in some way for the fact that I was, you know, that I was thumbing it to the left. And if I, if somebody had fixed that, I just think about maybe how much more consistent I could have been, maybe how much better I could have been, maybe how much quicker my release could have been. Uh, cause it seems to me like that was a pretty simple fix, but all through my time, I never ever had anybody say that to me. It was only after I started teaching shooting that I realized that that's what I was doing when I was a player. And right. so I think it's, you know, it's very, very important for anybody out there that's listening to, to certainly make sure that everything that you're doing to your point, that the motion is all directed towards helping the ball go into the basket. Here's a question that's kind of related to that. I'm just curious to get your take on it. So yeah. when you're teaching guys or you're working with somebody on just shooting a free throw, you mentioned, you know, when they're getting to do what they want to do, how do you feel about after a player comes out of their routine, whatever that routine might be, and they're going to shoot their free throw, where do you like to have them start the ball as before they get into their shooting motion? So in other words, when they pick up that dribble off the last you know move or dribble off their routine when they're at the foul line, where do you like to have them put the ball before they actually get into their shooting motion? Well, ultimately, I'm trying to create habits uh, that apply in – uh, as many shots as possible. So the habits that you're going to execute at the free throw line should be as sim similar as possible to a catch and shoot three and even to a pull up, although uh, that's sort of uh, outside the box a little bit more. But um, so I would encourage players to try and have 
the ball reasonably close to their body uh, and sort of down belly button height. And especially young players, I think they need that uh, the power that they generate from waist level up through their shot to help them uh, generate the power to get the ball to the rim. Older players, stronger players might be able to have more compact motion, but I think just the timing of having the ball sort of down around belly button height um, helps with synchronization, power generation, uh, and all these different ideas. I, I would encourage it to be as centered as possible. Ultimately, there's two things I'm really concerned about. I'm concerned about the middle of the hand being on the middle of the ball and getting the ball as much as we can online with the eyes. Um, and, uh, and so I'll let a player have uh, a fair amount of wiggle room for comfort as long as they're able to be in a position where they get pretty good physics. And if you can get the, uh, if, you, if your physics improve and you're able to do something that's, or, or if, you, if we need to sacrifice a small amount of physics to get a lot of comfort, I'm willing to do that, but I'm not allowed to, I'm not willing to sacrifice a lot of physics to get a little bit of comfort, if that makes sense. No, it makes total sense. All right, so next thing is, Let's talk a little bit about the about the feet, and especially now I'm thinking more rather than NBA players. I'm thinking about young kids, and there's always a debate about whether or not you teach kids to shoot off the one-two step. When do you start teaching them to shoot off the quote-unquote hop? Mm-hmm. Uh, although a lot of times the hop ends up being a very just fast one-two right. step. But just right. what's your thought on those two? Because I've always been a big proponent, especially with younger kids. I've seen very, very few kids under the age of 13 or so that can successfully execute a hop and shoot from any kind of distance with any type of correct form because they just don't generate the type of power and lift that you mentioned earlier about getting everything and all your motion going into your shot. I find that when kids shoot off the hop that a lot of their power goes into the floor and they end up shooting the ball short no matter what other kind of adjustments they make. So talk a little bit about your philosophy in terms of the feet when it comes to a young kid learning how to shoot the ball? Yeah, for, first thing is, uh, as trainers um, and, and skills coaches, we have to remember these aren't our players. Um, and so in, in my world, although it's less common in the NBA for a head coach to have an opinion, they're the head coach's opinion, or uh, sorry, the he- they're the head coach's um player and so if the head coach has a strong opinion on what he wants that player doing in certain situations it's my job to then take that player and build their skills to be able to execute his system now that doesn't happen as much in the nba that's more of a college basketball thing uh but i always try and keep that in mind that um, that it's not necessarily me try, uh, teaching them what I think is right. It's me preparing them for the situation that, that they're going to be facing. So if I had a strong opinion, but their head coach uh, had a conflicting opinion, I, it's kind of my duty to, to teach the kids how to do what the head coach needs, but then also prepare them because they're going to be, potentially have a different head coach with a different idea the next year. Um, so I personally go on the, uh, on the idea that I want players to be comfortable with all of them, but then know which one they like best. And if you have time on an open catch and shoot three, but you're going to shoot it 5% better if you hop or you left, right, or right, or whatever, then I don't care what footwork you use. I want the ball to go in the basket. And I think we, at times we can overteach this. And, uh, and, and there are definitely some situations where there is a right thing to do, but there's a lot of situations where it's who cares what you do, put the ball in the basket. Um, so I want players to know what they, they're most comfortable with. I want them to be really good at that. And then I want them to be getting better at all of them because there's, I think we'd all agree on a uh, a curl cut that we want inside foot, outside foot, forward pivot. But what happens if that pass gets deflected then and player has to, they lose their timing and they have to catch it outside their body 
on, uh, and now they have their outside foot as a pivot foot with a reverse pivot. Can they still make that shot? Um, so that's part of my answer. And then the other part of my answer is I start with a lot of hop uh, early on, not because I think hop is the best thing to do or the right thing to do, but simply because I want players to learn to synchronize their legs and use their legs evenly. And I think it's much easier to learn to use your legs evenly when initially they're doing the same thing at the same time. So hop into it. Now your feet are acting as one unit. You can learn to push with one unit. And then as they develop that habit of uh, pushing w uh, evenly with their legs, then I'll, I'll put them in situations to learn how to push evenly with their legs when their legs aren't doing the same thing at the same time. So now can we push evenly when we're on a one-two step or an inside foot pivot or outside foot reverse? Um, so a few different layers to that, that answer. No, I think that's very, I think that's very good uh, in terms of getting people to understand what it is that you're talking about with the feet and just, I like how you described both feet working together. I think that's something that honestly I could say that I didn't, necessarily think about uh like i said what i like about the one two from a young kid perspective is just i feel it helps them to generate enough p more power from their legs so that they can shoot the ball with good form with their upper body and their hands uh, but i can totally see what you're saying where you want them to be able to use both legs in you know in in a synchronistic way so that they're both going in the, up and and they're able to then transfer that into different kinds of scenarios because obviously you know, it's one thing to be able to shoot the ball standing still or, you know, we're just waiting on a catch and shoot versus shooting it off the dribble or shooting it off the move or catching it off a curl or off a flare or whatever the case might be. Uh, there's all types of different footwork and the more advanced you get, obviously the more tricks you need to have in your bag in order to be able to utilize all the different types of pivots and footwork and hops and steps and everything that's coming to the game. And now obviously compared to when you or I were growing up as shooters, uh, you know, a lot of the shooting that we see today with the step backs and the, you know, the different kinds of uh, footwork to get into the shot is even different from the way it was certainly when I played. I mean, a, a step back jump shot did not exist uh, during the time when I was playing college basketball back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. One, one thing that you touched on that I, I want to make sure I uh, make it a, a point about, uh, you said something about... Uh, you feel like players are able to generate more power with the one, two step. And that is probably very, very true of a lot of players, but I think young coaches, uh, the, the people just kind of starting out and figuring out their way through it need to be aware that, uh, just because it was comfortable for you or just because you feel like that, uh, you could generate more power doesn't mean that they're going to feel like it. And I've had a lot of players that they they'll be, they'll say, just to use your analogy uh, or your example, uh, oh no, I feel like I generate more power when I hop, or I feel like I generate more power when I, uh, and they give a, a contradictory answer to what, what we think. So uh, don't necessarily base what we, you want a player to do based on what you felt was more comfortable or you feel like generates more power. Uh, yeah, and I think I think that's a good point too about asking questions of the play, of your players. Uh, we've talked to some other coaches just in general about, you know, if you're a head coach at a high school or college and you're running practices and the number of coaches that are now coaching, asking questions as opposed to sort of right. pontificating and giving lectures about what's right and what's wrong. And so I think there's a much more – coaches are much more open today to asking questions of their players than yeah. maybe coaches back in the day. And so do you find yourself – asking more questions now in your, you know, while you're coaching than you did maybe 10, 15 years ago? I, I think I was always pretty open about that. Um, and uh, I think de I definitely ask better questions now. Uh, I think I listen to the answers better, whereas I might have asked the question before, <laughs> but it was, it was a setup question where it, I, they're going to say this and then I'm going to come back with it. Now I'm actually listening to the, to the answer. Um, and the longer I work with the player, I always tell them kind of in the first couple of workouts that in the beginning, 
uh, your voice doesn't matter to me as much, but we're going to get to a point where that's going to flip and your voice is going to be matter more to me than my own. Um, uh, and just so it's my job to educate them. And then, but even as I educate them, I'm never going to know what they feel. Um, and so I need them to tell me what they feel feel and early on in this the process what they feel isn't accurate like if if it were they'd be better shooters uh, but since it's not accurate they're they they miss shots so the feeling doesn't matter at that point as we start to teach and we build better habits then that feeling really really starts to matter a lot more and i need to know what it is so yeah we need to be asking questions we need to listen to the questions i think the one thing that I've personally gotten a lot better at over uh, really because it started with one player who I won't name, but uh, uh, an NBA guy that I, I would tell a lot of long winded uh, stories that, and use analogies. And that, and I thought, I kind of thought I was being clever. And, uh, and then I had a player who just obviously did not want to hear it. <laughs> and I struggled with it in the beginning. And uh, and then I just I learned that I had to be short, more short and concise, which I'm doing a terrible job of uh, here on the podcast, but uh, be short and concise with this guy. And uh, I think it made me a dramatically better coach. And th that player has gone from uh, somebody who quite honestly loathed me in the first month or two of our relationship to now one of my best friends in the NBA. And, uh, and because I, I think I was willing to change and, and give be the kind of coach that he needed as opposed to um, the kind of coach I thought I should be. Yeah. I think that's key to any relationship player coach for sure is can you adapt and make your style fit with, your player, your team, because if you just have your one way of doing things and you're kind of set completely in your ways and this is the way it is, then you're not really getting to know, again, if you're coaching an entire team, you get to know each player and kind of what buttons to push and how they need to be motivated and how you can coach them. And in your case, when you're working with one individual player at a time, in the case of your NBA players, obviously you get an opportunity to really – you know, dive deep with them and get to know them on a real personal level. And then once you kind of figure out what makes them tick, it I'm sure helps you to, you know, to really get into the psyche of what they're doing and get into their mechanics and really build that relationship and that trust that's needed in order for them to make the, the changes that, you know, you see that they need to make and that they obviously want to make so they can continue to have success. You mentioned, you mentioned talking about their feelings and what they're feeling while they're shooting. Can you describe or tell us what what are so, what's a typical answer? So if you're talking to an NBA player and you're asking them to describe their feeling when they're shooting, what kind of answers are you expecting, or what are some of the answers that you get from players when you ask them about the feeling that they have while they're shooting? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that's the first time that anybody's ever asked me that. Uh, All right, hey, I did something right hey. tonight, Dave. That's good. Uh, what am I expecting when I, well, first of all, early on in the process, I'm expecting a terrible answer because <laughs> they don't know. Um, so a lot of the times you say, okay, so uh, what do you feel there? And uh, uh, I don't know. Um, and so you're really, I'll, I'll put, I'll keep pushing. I'll just say, okay, well, but give me more. Like, like I, I Right or wrong, you got to tell me, like, which finger did you feel that coming off of? Did you feel like you did something different? Did you feel like the same shot? Was it comfortable? Was it wildly uncomfortable? And then if it was wildly uncomfortable, do we understand the, the fact that uncomfortable can be good early on? That if you're comfortable with it and if you're trying to do something differently and it's comfortable – then you're probably not doing it differently. You probably think you are, but you're not. Uh, so the fact that it feels uncomfortable may actually be an indication that we're really making a change that we might need to make. Um, as players go on, uh, their answers get 
that are much more educated and they just have a better feel of they have a better feel of what has happened in specific shots and and that has to be trained that um uh you know the feel do you guys play golf you i guys, do uh, I jason's do. much more of a golfer than me so I, I, do. I don't know that my my golf ability will be of much value here so i'm sure jason and i could could uh hit a shot and go i have no idea where that's going or i thought i hit that well 95 percent of the time right <laughs> and uh but you ask tiger woods um uh, on impact if he could answer on impact what is going to happen to that ball he could probably tell you exactly what's going to happen that oh I, I hit that a little thin that's going to come up seven yards short and it will come up say, tiger's drives are going to go to the right or the left right. <laughs> don't say that that hurts that hurts my feelings i'm, I'm a huge tiger fan but <laughs> no he, he drives it impeccably now um so we need we need to we need to educate and put players in a situation and and I just encourage honesty that I'll say okay what do you feel but don't tell me the answer that you think I want to hear tell me the truth and if you have no idea what you felt tell me that and then trying to put them in a situation because what I saw was this so let's let's shoot a couple more and when if I see that again I'll point it out and then hopefully maybe you'll be able to start feeling what I'm seeing. And, and it's just an ongoing dialogue. If you're a basketball coach in the greater Cleveland area and you have a passion for teaching the game and might be interested in joining the Head Start Basketball Camp coaching staff this summer, please reach out to us via email at headstartbasketball at USA.net. All right, so here's a question that ties back in what you do with your youth shooting clinics with what you do with your NBA players. So when you're working with an NBA guy, I totally understand the process of you're going through the feelings and the different things. And, and an NBA player is going to have a lot more uh, patience is maybe the wrong word, but it's going to have a lot more interest in digging into all the small minutia of how they're going to improve their shot. Cause obviously their livelihood depends on it. And if they're working yeah. with you, they obviously have a tremendous desire to get better. So then if you're working with a 12 year old kid, who's not going to have the same amount of patience and the same ability to articulate what's going on with their shot, how do you take what you do with an NBA player and bring it down to the level that a youth player can absorb and benefit from your teaching and your coaching no, number one uh there's the whole spectrum of uh of kid where you get the those kids who go and lo love the details even more and they want to know everything and they keep coming back and asking more and more smart questions and they want to give you feedback and and clarify things you get those kids and then you get the other kids at the opposite end of the spectrum where they weren't listening to a word you were saying so, <laughs> um, and disagree with everything that you're saying. Um, so what do I do? Um, I try and number one, make it a safe place to have an opinion. And I tell kids like you're, it's, if it's a, if you have learned something else or you have a different idea, that is totally fine. You just got to come and talk to me about it. And you have to explain to me, what you've learned and what you believe, and then we'll have a discussion because it's not necessarily about me getting you to look like you're uh, a cover model for shooting technique magazine. Uh, if there were such a thing, it's about getting you to make more shots. And so sometimes I'll be willing to compromise because it's the right thing for you, but uh, and just creating sort of a safe environment for the, uh, the kids to explore and have an opinion. Um, I don't know if that even answers anything that you you asked, but no, it does. I I think just my 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 thought process here is again I I've, I've spent very little time around NBA players, but I spend a lot of time around kids. Yeah. So my interest is how do I go about being a better coach to a kid who wants to improve their shot but isn't able to spend four hours or doesn't want to spend four hours a day working on their shot and doesn't want to dissect every little bit. What are some things, some key takeaways that maybe I can use or maybe a coach out there can use to help the kids that they work with? You know, how can they pick your brain and, and look at what you do and, 
and bring it down to a level where I can look at a kid's shot and be able to help them in in some way in a you know in a in a less intensive form I guess is what I'm what, what I'm saying. The the biggest thing that I would suggest is pick one idea and hold them and yourself accountable to improving that one thing as opposed to taking a shotgun approach and and the reason I say that I went uh, to the golf driving range and I I always liked going and if there was somebody giving a lesson um at one of the stalls at the driving range i would try and position myself so that i can kind of listen in on the lesson not because i would necessarily want to learn but i uh wanted to hear how that person was teaching maybe they would say something that in a way that i would be able to to take that phrasing and there was a particular guy giving a uh, a middle-aged woman a lesson and with every swing he gave her new advice so with every swing, he said, OK, well, on that swing, here's what you did. And then she'd hit another ball trying to improve the thing that he just said. And then he's OK. And on that one, you did this. And so his his coaching was all very reactionary to uh, what she had just done. And I, I listened to it thinking this poor woman has just taken <laughs> 45 swings and got 45 different teaching points. And he never gave her a chance to work on any one of them. And I, I remember, uh, I don't remember the player that I was working with, but it, it was back when I was working with the Canadian college team. And uh, I can remember the, ne- the hoop that I was at the next time I had a workout thinking, I can't be that guy. I have to have a clear idea of what we're working on it on what we're working on and then work on it and give a player a chance to improve because they have to go through that discomfort phase and uh, and they have to develop accurate feelings about it. And that doesn't happen in five shots or 45 swings. That happens through hours and days and, and weeks of just being consistent. So don't bite off more than you can chew. Just pick one idea that you're better to pick one idea that's going to make them 3% better than uh, than try and tackle everything. Yeah, I like that. So let's just give a concrete example maybe for somebody who's out there listening and make sure that I have the idea right. So let's say I have a kid who they shoot and their guide hand is completely underneath the ball to the point where they're almost it's almost a two-handed shot. And at the same time, they also have – you know, their toes, as they go up for the shot, their toes are pointed off to, you know, 10 to, to, to 10 o'clock. So I'm going to pick, let's say I say, all right, we're going to focus on the guide hand. And so for the most part, I'm going to ignore the feet and just focus on, hey, let's get the guide hand in the correct position so that we can turn this two-handed shot into a one-handed shot. And then once we master that particular aspect of the shot, then we can go back and address the feet or whatever else, you know, we may see as another flaw. Is that kind of the what yeah, you're yeah. suggesting in terms of progression. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, and even on a shot to shot basis, like don't say, all right, we got to hold your follow through there. Oh, we got to finish on balance that like I sometimes go 10 shots without saying a word to players. Um, other than like, good. Oh, good one. Okay. Good. Good. Eh, not your best. Uh, just cause I'm letting them feel their way through this one thing that I've asked them to think about. So it's not, hey, hold your follow through. All right, make sure you're snapping your wrist. All right, finish on your toes. All right, don't forget to bend your knees. Okay, and on this one, do this. You're you're not trying to avoid giving them a million things to think about. Give them the time to think about one over and over and over again. Got it. All right, I want to ask you a question here about coaching your coaches. So I'm assuming when you run one of your coaching clinics, I know when I went through and looked uh, at your website, you have some coaches that work with you that are part of your full-time staff. Do you have other coaches that come and work at the shooting clinics with you, or is it always those the full-time people that you have with you all the time? No, at, at, at every clinic I do, I ask for volunteers and usually have no trouble getting a bunch of eager uh, parents or coaches that uh, that want to come and uh, and be a part of it. So I encourage them to almost act as participants, but just holding the kids accountable to working on the things that we're working on. Uh, and then just 
opening up a dialogue and I tell them the same things I tell the uh, the players that come and ask uh, uh, questions and, and feel free to disagree with me that there's a million ways to shoot the basketball. And while I have one theory, there's a bunch of successful ways. So if you're teaching something different, just talk to me about it and we'll figure I'll explain to you when I might actually go with that, even though it doesn't sort of fit in my theory uh when i might actually use that idea or when i would try and really avoid it and uh and just try and teach as much as i possibly can so not only while someone's at the clinic as a player you're not only coaching the players but in that case when you have volunteer coaches or parents or whoever that person may be you're also coaching the coaches at the same time yeah and those uh, they're almost more valuable than the kids because they have the maturity and the attention span uh to uh, to retain the information better. And so um, if I have this resource that uh, if I'm in a, a new town, I'm going to be gone a day later and they might not see me for a, a, a long time if ever again, but they're going to see these coaches that are there. And these coaches can impact 12, 24, however many kids uh, over a longer period of time. So I, I really make an effort to get as much information to those guys so that they can uh, continue to help. And a lot of times, especially at the youth level, you have wildly inexperienced coaches helping. And God bless them for doing it. It's where we all started. Um, and this is a part of their prog- or their development to, uh, to get better, to learn and be exposed to new ideas. Yeah, I think that's a key to improving youth basketball whether it's uh, here in the united states or we are obviously in canada if you have better coaching uh both in terms of technical knowledge but also just in terms of how to build relationships and interact with kids i think if you could improve those two areas in youth coaching i think we'd have a lot better youth basketball situation i wanted to ask you about just if if you could and i'm not sure if it's even possible but can you share sort of what a typical clinic day looks like uh, for you? I don't know if there is a typical yeah. clinic day or, or what that what that would look like. So if I show up at a for the love of the game clinic, what does that look like? Number one, it's, it's me running it. So uh, while I do have some uh, assistant coaches that run this stuff in, uh, in smaller towns, uh, if you hire me, I'm the one coming to, to run the clinic. Uh, we spend, uh, you, basically each player will have a basketball in their hand the entire time that it's not lining up and uh, uh, and just going through a drill for the sake of doing a drill. Um, we I have the kids shooting through the entire uh, clinic. It'll be a, a, a two to five minute teaching point of here's something very specific I want you to do. Uh, like here's what to do with this part of your body and here's why to do it now take five minutes and start to, to focus on it and what I really try and preach early on is that they are the kids the players are accountable to their own success and I try and teach them that I don't make them better I give them advice that they use to make themselves better. And most kids don't get that. Uh, and you can see in the first 10 minutes of the clinic where I, I, I say to them, you are the shooting coach today. Here's two things I need you to look at. In three minutes, be able to answer these two questions for me. Uh, how do you position your feet at the start of your shot? How do you position your feet at the, the end of your shot? Don't do what you think is right. Just know what you do, even if you do something different every single time. And, okay, you've got three minutes to figure out the answers. What, look at your feet every single shot so that you know what you do. And the second the kids go to the hoop in the first five minutes, they forget to look at their feet. Like, I've given them pretty <laughs> clear direction on what they need to do, but they're so used to being the player and expecting other people to give advice that they don't it's hard for them to remember that they have to gather this information themselves then 40 minutes later you've got 48 kids in the gym who are all stopping and looking critically at what their body's doing and then just and starting to say like does this make sense is this good or not 
Um, so it's really fun to watch that and um, that progression as the kids go from unaware, uncaring to 45 minutes going, oh yeah, wait, this is on me. So the first hour is typically on foot position. Uh, the second hour I typically do on how to grip the basketball and, uh, and the ball path from triple threat to their set point. Third hour will be more from the set point to the release point. Uh, and then if I do a full day clinic in the, uh, in the afternoon, we will then break down different layers of drills because it's, it's one thing to learn what and why to do something or what to do and why to do it. But the huge part is, okay, how do you build this habit? And this is something that I think sets me apart as a shooting coach and what I think makes me uh, as successful as I have been is that I have a, a pretty good progression now of little tiny drills that help a player uh, learn how to build a new habit. That's not just, okay, do this form shooting, now try and do it again speed, that I have these little d drills that that I call sort of stepping stones or layers to get them to the destination. Can you give us an example of one of those drills, something that you do with the kids that sure. are part of that progression? Obviously, you don't have to go through all of them, but if you just give us maybe one, just so we have an idea of what that might look like. So we'll start really simple and we'll say, uh, what if a player lands with their feet really close together when they shoot the basketball? Well, hopefully we all know uh, okay, the what is feet. I talk about hip width apart. I don't, I don't say shoulder width apart, and I won't go into the uh, reason why, but it's, it's just fairly simple. Even though hip and shoulders are the same, I just like the heck, I'm going to go into it. I hate the fact that we pick uh, shoulder width apart, is shoulders being the reference point, because you can't see your own shoulders. So when you tell me I want your, your feet to be as wide as your shoulders, I think well, I, I can't, I'm guessing how wide my, my shoulders are. I talk about hip width. Uh, when I look down at my feet, I can see my hips. My hips are the same width as my shoulders. I talk hip width. So we know what to do now. We want our feet hip width apart, but you have the habit of landing with your feet close together. Now we're going to, and hopefully we understand why to do it. Well, if our feet are wider apart, we're more stable. And so if we're uh, cutting hard to our left and we land with wide feet, we can stop the bad energy. Uh, so now we know what and, and why. The first thing is, can we learn to do it in the most simple situation? You have a bad habit. You land with your feet close together. Let's learn to land with them wide apart. So just stand with your feet wide apart, hop forward, consciously looking, mindfully looking at your feet, doing something different, force yourself to land, and, uh, and then uh, shooting a shot from there. Okay, so if we were, if you have a brain, you could do that. Like, as long as you have a brain, you can pretty much stand with your feet wide apart, hop and land with your feet wide apart. So there's no excuse for you not to be able to do that. Then slowly making that ever so slightly more difficult. Well, if you can ha hop straight forward and land with your feet wide apart, can you hop to your right and land with your feet wide apart? Well, that's not m that much harder, so I should be able to do that. Could you hop and turn and land with your feet wide apart? Well, again, not that much harder, I should be able to do that. Could you catch a pass hop and turn and land? Could you one, two step with a pivot and land with, and so you're just slowly making the situation that this player has to do this new thing in more, slightly more complicated. And, uh, and I, again, I think a lot of coaches, they say, here's what and why, and do a good job of explaining that, and then say, now go do it at game speed. And the player is, doesn't have the time to be mindful because their habit is, the opposite. They fail. Coach gets frustrated. Player gets frustrated. One or both of them give up. And it's it's not the player's fault at that point. It's the situation's fault. I think that's really good advice. I think it's sometimes when we think about what coaches and players do and the amount of time that it does take to be able to make those changes. One, you have to have a reason why you want to change and you have to have the ability to, as you've done, 
to share those reasons and then give the kid an opportunity to be able to practice it in such a way that it makes sense that they don't get overwhelmed. Because I know that when you work with any player, and again, I don't think it matters the age, but when you overwhelm them with something at the beginning, it's very, very difficult for them to grasp the whole picture when they don't grasp the small details that go into building that big picture. And I think that's what you're describing where, yeah, we could talk all we want about foot placement, hand placement, and balance and all these different things. And a kid can literally understand all those things. Then you just say, okay, go do it. And you're going to put all of that together all in one piece, all at the same time and ask them to go at full speed. I mean, there's, there's no way. And I, I think about it in terms of if I was trying to, even as an adult, if I was trying to learn a new skill, something that I wasn't very good at, you know, if I was, somebody was trying to teach me how to play the piano and they said, okay, here's the key you have to hit. And then after that, you got to hit this key with this finger and then you got to move your foot on the pedal. Now go ahead and play this song. I'd be completely lost. I'd have no idea what I was doing, even though I may have been concentrating and focused in on yeah. trying to absorb those details unless I broke it down into small steps and really understood each little part of it and was able to practice that, I don't think there's any way that I could ever put it together. And we sometimes forget as coaches that players need that time to be able to really work on, especially something as personal as your shot. Because everybody, you know, you've said it multiple times that there are lots and lots of different ways to shoot the basketball. There's a, there's definitely theories and there's definitely things that are, going to help you to be more successful, but each individual shooter, each individual player sort of adapts those to their own personal style. And you have to, you have to allow kids the opportunity and players to have the opportunity to really break down that skill. And so I love how you describe that. And I just think it's, it's something for anybody that's out there, whether you're a coach who works with players trying to improve their shot or you're a player listening and, you know, you're trying to think about how can I become a better shooter by breaking it down into those smaller pieces and then putting it all back together at the end, I think you're going to end up with much better results. Yeah. I talk about uh, micro skills that we have the game of basketball that has these skills of shooting and passing and dribbling and defending and rebounding, blah, blah, blah. And then within shooting the skill of shooting, we have all these micro skills of, can you be balanced? Can you get your non-shooting hand on the uh, off the ball? Can you get your shooting hand underneath the middle of the ball? Can you? All these different things are micro skills, and you will the players will miss because they have a flaw in one of their micro skills. They grip the ball uh, improperly, and so if I if I struggled, and I, I love that you talked about the piano because that's the analogy that I use a lot uh, as well. Is that if if I was learning to pr- play the piano, uh, you wouldn't put Mozart sheet music down in front of me as my lesson. You'd put Baba Black Sheep. And we'd start there. And uh, and then as my skills in Baba Black Sheep got better, we'd go to a slightly more complex song and then a slightly more complex song. And that's what I try and do with, do with shooting. And then if we do one day get to Mozart, um, and there's one part of the song where you keep hitting a wrong chord or a wrong key, um, how would you break that habit? It's just over and over again, you kept hitting, hitting the wrong key. What, how, would you, how would you do it? I think we'd all isolate that bar uh, and play it really slowly to learn to, okay, when I get here, I can't hit that key. That's the wrong, that's the one I always hit, and that's the mistake. I got to do this. And then as we got better at that, we slowly speed it up, and we'd add more music at the beginning and the end of that until we could apply this new habit into the situation. But we don't do that a lot of times in, in basketball. We say, no, just play Mozart at gain speed and don't hit that key. Yeah, I think we do a lot of big picture stuff as opposed to, breaking it down. And one of the reasons I think in a lot of times is just from a time standpoint, uh, you know, if I'm a youth coach and I have eight players on my team you know, and I'm trying to work and help them on their shot, I don't have, you know, a lot of the time that I might need to be able to break those skills down. It really comes down to does that individual player, are they motivated enough after they've been given good coaching? And I think that's the key. You have to provide them with what you just described, these micro skills, these breakdowns of steps and, and show them that, look, this is the way 
that you can improve and get better. And then ultimately, the other thing you said earlier when you're describing what you do at your clinics is that they're, they have to be their own shooting coach and be willing to take the time to analyze and work and improve. And, you know, we all know that you don't become a better shooter in an hour, uh, you know, one day a week. It takes, it takes repetition after repetition after repetition. And that's, you know, including the time to just break down those micro skills and then eventually putting it all back together into the same puzzle. Dave, we're coming up on an hour and a half. So I want to wrap this up by asking you one question uh, to kind of finish it off. And that is, what do you love most about what you do as a shooting coach? When you get up in the morning, what's the one thing that just excites you to no end about what you get to do every day? I love that moment where I see that a player is starting to get it and they don't even know that they're getting it. Yeah, and they can be doing one hand form shooting from 10 feet out and airballing shots. But then I just see that one where maybe they still even airballed it, but their bad habit was better. And I go, oh, okay, there, there's that glimmer of hope. And the hairs on my arms and the back of my neck will stand up. And when I know, all right, we're getting somewhere. I love that. That's awesome. I love it. Um, before we get out of here, Dave, I want you to have an opportunity to share out your contact information, share out where people can learn more about your clinics. And for anybody that was listening to the podcast that wants to reach out, reach out to you, learn more about what you do and learn more about how you help people with their shooting. Uh, go ahead and do that now. And if there's anything else that we didn't touch on or that you want to share as kind of your parting shot, you can go ahead and do that as well. I'm working really hard right now on uh, creating some online courses to teach some very specific habits uh, or how to relearn some very specific bad habits uh, in shooting. Uh, and you can find out about those as time goes on on CoachDaveLove.com um, and on social media, Instagram and Twitter, the two that I use the most. Uh, you can find me on Coach Dave Love or at Coach Dave Love, I guess. It showed my age there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it, when you go to CoachDaveLove.com, look for the newsletter and sign up because I have uh, 42 emails uh, of teachable information on very specific topics that uh, that I, I send people for free um, on my newsletter through CoachDaveLove.com. Um, so look for that and uh, and and subscribe to the newsletter. Dave, we cannot thank you enough for jumping on with us tonight, spending an hour and a half sharing your expertise and your experience that you've had in the game uh, over the last uh, many years. And the, the fact that you work with players all the way down to the youth level, all the way up to the NBA, I think brought a very unique perspective and I think there's a tremendous amount of value here for the people that are out there. So we want to thank you for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player, our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.